Thank you, Valeria. First of all, I want to thank our host, Dr. Vestovshek, for this uh, very nice invitation in this uh, wonderful meeting. So in the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, this uh, topic, uh, the CMML topic. So as you know, uh, since uh, the creation of this new uh, nosological entity called the overlap syndromes, MDS, MPNs, uh, this uh, happened a few years ago in 2001 actually and then it was refined in 2008 and uh, among these uh, malignancies included in this uh, category the, the chronic myelomonocytic leukemia CMML is by far the most frequent uh, uh, disease. Uh, with regard to the diagnostic criteria for CMML these are the ones uh, uh, listed by the WHO so, of course, we have to have the, the peripheral blood uh, absolute monocytosis, which means more than 1,000 monocytes, circulating monocytes in the peripheral blood, by definition. We have to exclude uh, uh, to have uh, any presence of uh, um, molecular rearrangement, such as BCRable or PGFR beta rearrangement, which will uh, define uh, different diseases. We have to have less than 20% bone marrow blast and also in the peripheral blood, uh, otherwise we would we'd, we'd deal with acute leukemia patients right now, as you know. But it's important to underline that when we talk about blast in this disease, we need to uh, refer not only to myeloblast, but also to monoblast and promonocytes, and this is very important. Also, we need to have dysplasia in one or more myeloid lineages. Uh, and uh, if myeloid dysplasia, dysplasia is uh, absent or minimal, we still may make a diagnosis of CMML if we have uh, other requirements met. Uh, among those, uh, we have to, uh, to have a persistent monocytosis and uh, we have to exclude the reactive monocytosis. But also we uh, have to possibly show a uh, marker of chronality, so some marker of malignant chronality, especially cytogenetic or molecular abnormalities. Up to few, few years ago, this was not very frequent because, uh, as you know, uh, cytogenetic abnormalities are not very frequent in CML. It's probably about uh, uh, one quarter of 25% of, uh, of patients. And the molecular abnormalities, were not very well known up to a few years ago, apart from maybe the RAS mutations. But in the very last few years, thanks to the uh, deep sequencing technolo technologies, now we know that uh, uh, several uh, molecular abnormalities may, be, um, may, be, may occur in patients with the CMML, so that now uh, patients with this disease, uh, more than 90% of patients with CMML have at least one of these mutations if they are uh, investigated. So this is kind of easier to make diagnosis. And also we have some novel uh, diagnostic strategies now developing. This has just been published uh, a few weeks ago, and this is a very important study from the French group uh, led by Dr. Solari. Uh, what they've shown here is, uh, I, wanna sh I wanna highlight for you, this is the, uh, the, the normal picture of uh, distribution of monocytes according to the CD14 and CD16 expression in, a, in this is in a healthy person. As you can see, the majority of monocytes, so-called monocyte one, express uh, high CD14 and low level of CD16. But still, we have two populations, minor population of monocytes, one which is called monocyte two, with uh, both a uh, high expression of uh, CD14 and CD16, and one pop uh, smaller population of monocytes with uh, uh, high CD16 and low <laughs> CD14. What happens in CMML, uh, the patients with CMML uh, seems to, uh, to uh, express <laughs> almost all monocytes in the uh, monocyte one category, so the one with uh, high CD14 and low CD16, as you can see here, and when they sh what they showed in this important study is that uh, um, all, more than 90% of, of uh, monocytes in this patient, 95% of monocytes in this patient are of these subtypes. And if you compare with, <coughs> with the unaged con co matched control uh, population or patient with other malignancies, not CMML, or reactive monocytosis, the, 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 it's completely different. So this seems to, to really to associate with CMML, and this is a, an important new finding. Okay, when uh, we have also to deal with some subclassification sub of CMML, so when one, uh, one, uh, once the CMML was, uh, was classified among MDS, uh, 
uh, everybody knew that, that there were patients with uh, um, monocytosis and also high white blood cells count. So these patients were behaving more as uh, proliferative subtypes of patients than dysplastic uh, patients. And that's why the FAB, FAB group uh, proposed a subclassification in a CMML malodysplastic uh, variant and a maloproliferative variant according to a threshold of 13,000 white blood cells in the peripheral blood, which is an arbitrary um, um, an arbitrary chosen threshold, but it was useful from a practical point of view. Then, since uh, the CMML was classified among the MDS MPN, so the overlap syndromes, this subsacrification disappeared, and uh, the CMML1 and CMML2 subclassification was proposed. This is based only on blasts in the bone marrow and the peripheral blood. And this is because of the, of the uh, association of the high percentage of blast with the worst prognosis that is very well known. But now, uh, the, this uh, subclassification of CML1 and CML2 is also under debate. This is a very nice uh, recent paper published in December last year by the German group, Düsseldorf group. And the, what they showed is that if we take not only the 10% per, uh, threshold, but also the 5%, we can have three subtypes of, uh, of CMML. The one which is called zero is with blast, more marrow blast up to 5%, and then from five, from five to 10 is the CMML one, and the CMML two is more than 10. So this is also now under debate because it might change a little bit the subclassification. So we have well-defined diagnostic criteria for CML, but uh, the, the clinical features in this disease are very heterogeneous, and the natural course of the disease, so the life expectation for patients is extremely heterogeneous. And that's why, over the years, uh, we have um, developed uh, uh, some scoring system to try to, to make easier life for doctors when we have to deal with patients with CML. So the first one, the Dusseldorf score, it was actually developed, excuse me, it was actually developed for, for MDS, but uh, it was also uh, developed for, for uh, CMML. And as you can see here, it uh, it's, uh, includes uh, among the variables uh, in this uh, scoring system that are bone marrow blast, hemoglobin plated, and LDH, and there are three groups here. After 10 years, it came out the MD Anderson pronounced score that was developed in MD Anderson, and this was new because the absolute lymphocyte count was uh, uh, demonstrated as being associated with uh, survival. So high lymphocyte counts are more than 2,500 lymphocytes in the peripheral blood, together with immature myeloid cells. And so in, with this scoring system, four groups were identified. And then this scoring system was also a little bit refined uh, a few years later on a, on a higher uh, population of patients. This is the global score uh, scoring system, which has been developed for, for uh, myelodysplastic syndromes, uh, always at MD Anderson, but with the, the, with the intent to, to be, a, to be uh, valid also for CMML and also for proliferative CMML. And then uh, we have the revised IPSS, as you probably know, sure you know, and this is uh, uh, including bone marrow blast, the cytopenias, the degrees of cytopenias, and the new uh, subclassification according to cytogenetics, and we have five uh, groups. And then the, in the very last two years, we had a group of uh, scoring system that has been developed and proposed for CMML, and uh, this is uh, the uh, CML specific uh, prognostic scoring system by the Spanish group, and this is the Mayo score, the, the group, the French score, and then the molecular Mayo score, and I will give you some details on this now. So uh, a few words about the cytogenetics because this is a, uh, an important finding. So the Spanish group uh, studied 400 patients uh, and found uh, cytogenetic anomalies in uh, about 27% of patients, uh, the most frequent being the trisomy 8. And what they showed is that patients with trisomy 8 were behaving, uh, had a, a very bad, bad survival, so they were behaving as the patients with uh, the abnormality of chromosome 7 or complex karyotypes. So they defined the high risk with all these three uh, sub-types sub, uh, of, of um, um, cell genetics. So this is different from the previous cell genetics used in MDS. And with this uh, uh, um, cytogenetic score, uh, the, the Spanish group, together with, uh, with uh, the, the Pavia group and the Dusseldorf group, developed this uh, CMS-specific pronostic scoring system in which they included the, the um, uh, subtype of CMS according to the, the WHO, so according to the baroblast, the, the web loss cells, so the subtypes according to the FAB subtype, and then the cytogenetics that I already told you, and the uh, transfusion requirement. And according to, 
to this core, they can, could define four risk groups that uh, uh, are able to stratify patients according to survival, as you can see, uh, both for, uh, for uh, overall survival and for the uh, acute leukemia uh, risk of, uh, of transformation in acute leukemia. This is the molecular Mayo model in which uh, uh, actually the, the Mayo model, which was including hemoglobin uh, uh, monocytosis uh, circulating immature myeloid cells and platelets, have been uh, uh, refined with the inclusion of the mutation of SXL1 that has been proposed from the French group. So uh, practically putting together the French uh, uh, scoring system and the, and the Mayo systems, they proposed this molecular Mayo model that uh, was shown to be very, very uh, good in, uh, in uh, stratifying four risk, risk groups, as you can see here. So, uh, because no one of these uh, uh, prognostic scoring systems has been universally accepted, uh, it's now ongoing uh, a nice international efforts, which is called International uh, CMI Consortium, in which uh, a few hospitals in the USA and also the French the French uh, group and uh, the one uh, uh, from the University of Milan uh, have been put together and set up a database which is now including more than 1,800 patients. And um, so this is the overall survival, as you can see from these 1,800 patients. So all, and the median survival is 32 months, um, uh, two and a half years, practically. And uh, uh, what has uh, been shown by this uh, ongoing study is that uh, all the scoring systems that I uh, refer to uh, are able to stratify the patients according to their risk of, of death, and uh, they are very similar. So there's no clear winner over here. Every, every of these uh, scoring systems works fine with, in this uh, uh, huge population of patients. Still, I want to show you that uh, the dysplastic patients uh, have a better uh, survival according to, in comparison to the proliferative patients, and this is also important. And according to the genetic characteristics uh, uh, in these studies, we have shown that, that uh, the patients with SXL1 mutation or CBL mutation and also the RNX1 mutations, they have a worse survival uh, in comparison to others. Also, the SRF2 is, uh, is a borderline, and other mutations are not significant for survival. But the SLX1 and CBL are uh, independently associated with survival when uh, adjusted for other covariates. So, uh, altogether, these are the conclusion for the prognostic uh, and risk classification uh, issue. Uh, we know that CMML1 and CMML2 WHO classification is still recommended, but it's, it's probably not, uh, not enough, not sufficient to discriminate between uh, low and high risk patients. So we still need to subclassify patients according to the FAB uh, subclassification and dysplastic and proliferative variant because this is important for clinical implications. The prognostic power, power of the clinical models have reached an asymptote, and so uh, right now the clinical genetics and genetic consensus uh, is trying to be reached in order to develop a new scoring system which will be pro possibly universally validated. Now, let's move uh, to, to the treatment of CMML patients. Uh, for, for the sake of time, I'm just uh, focusing on, uh, on the hypomethylation agents uh, because this is uh, the only, actually the only uh, treatment uh, that we can uh, uh, give to the patients uh, um, apart from, from support, of course. So this is the listing of studies published uh, with patients treated with hypomethylation agents, uh, you know, a few studies. What I want to uh, underline here is, let's start with from the decitamine, uh, patient, patient treated with decitamine. You can see the, the overall response rate from, ranging from 16% to 69%, and also with, uh, with uh, a few patients reaching uh, uh, CR, uh, apart from this study where it was 58%, and these are the median survival. But uh, I want to, to underline that these uh, studies are all uh, uh, retrospective. The only one which is controlled and prospective is the French study study, the first name is Brown, and uh, when in this study they, they have shown an overall response rate of 38% and 10% CR rate with a 48% of survival at two years, and this is a very nice study in which it was also uh, shown that, that, that high expression of CUN and CMIB uh, were associated with uh, inferior survival. And then uh, uh, moving to the azacitidine uh, uh, studies, all these studies are retrospective, and uh, as you can see here, the response rates are quite high. 
the overall response rate ranging from you know, from 43 to to 60 percent, and uh, also with uh, an important uh, percentage of patients reaching a uh, complete remission. But uh, this up is up to to 213. Then if we move to to 214, this this study was just published uh, last year, a few months ago, and this is the only study that has been uh, performed in. A, this is a control phase two study in a patient with CMML with azacitidine, so they included 30 patients in this study and with a median age is 70 years, and these are the characteristics. And the response rate, as you can see here, are much, much lower than it reported by the retrospective study. So the CR is only 7%, zero uh, partial emission, and marrow CR 7%. So very, very low response rate according to this, which is the only prospective uh, uh, studies published so far. And in, in, uh, indeed, the, the, the authors conclude saying that, uh, that uh, sorry, um, given these findings, uh, they, they caution against the use of ADA as a standard of care in patients with CMML, and they actually encourage further clinical trials uh, because uh, there are a uh, few uh, important uh, uh, findings here. So, uh, as regards the, the cytamine in CMML, there's an, an Italian study that has been actually concluded for the enrollment, but it's still uh, uh, under uh, uh, revision for, for, for the analysis of, of, of the results. And this study was uh, performed a few years ago. Uh, these are the, the inclusion criteria. So patients uh, with CMML, both uh, uh, dysplastic or proliferative uh, subtype, when they were proliferative, they had to have uh, two additional uh, uh, risk factors that are here listed, and uh, so these, these were the, the, the inclusion criteria in this study, and the characteristics of the 43 patients included are here, so 72 years of median, uh, median, median age, and uh, ranging from 47 to 84, 28% with cytogenetics anomalies, and uh, you, see, you can see here uh, two-thirds of the patients were CML1 and one-third was CML2. And these are the preliminary results, uh, uh, response at six months, as you see. The, the CR rate is 40%, uh, is uh, really very, very close to the French one, uh, that, where, where was 38%, so this is very, very similar. And stable disease in 19% of patients and progression uh, in 35% uh, of the patients. But this study was important also because uh, from uh, uh, um, uh, some of these patients were, were studied uh, for, for, biologic, for a biological uh, part of the study, and it was shown that uh, the, the presence of somatic mutation was not associated to response, as you can see here, but, uh, uh, but the methylome, so the, the pattern of methylation, and it's not the intensity of the methylation, but the, the, the pattern of the methylation, so the, the genes that are methylated, uh, they define find different uh, subgroup of patients. So responders have a different pattern of methylation in comparison to non-responders. And uh, this is very important, and this is just published uh, a few weeks ago in JCI, because if confirmed, this is a way to uh, try to select patients uh, that might have more uh, chance to respond to the cytamine uh, in, uh, in CML patients. Now, a few words uh, about allogeneic stem cell transplant because, you know, this is the only uh, option uh, that is curative for, uh, for this disease. Uh, the results are only uh, retrospective studies. This is the Fred, Fred Hutchison uh, um, uh, casistic that has been published a few years ago, and then it was also updated later on in a second publication. What you can see here is that uh, the, the relapse free survival at 10 years is 38 percent, so it's, it's it's nice because we have, we have a plateau, so we can really cure a minority of patients. But uh, uh, there are also a lot of, uh, the mortality is, is high, it's 35%, the, the transplant rate of mortality, and the last percent uh, up to 27% at 10 years. This is the, the um, ENT uh, casistics, and this is even worse, probably because it's a retrospective study. So uh, as you can see here, the last three survival is only 18%, and especially the non-relapse mortality is very, very high, 52%. And uh, the following one is that this is the French uh, study the, that has been published uh, also two years ago. And uh, also here you can see the, uh, this is some, something in the middle. So we have a, a non-relapse mortality of 36%, and a relapse free survival of 30% actually at three years, so it's a quite good result, but still with very high toxicity in this subtype of patients. So to conclude, uh, with what are the therapeutic recommendations in patients with CMML? 
Well, we, at uh, first, when we decide how, what, how to treat a patient, we need to see if the patient is dysplastic or proliferative, and then what's the number of blasts for the patient. And then patient with uh, a dysplastic variant of CMML and, uh, and uh, a low percentage of blast, uh, they might be managed with supportive therapy just to aim to correct cytopenias. Patients with severe anemia with a low level of erythropoietin in the serum, they might, might be treated with erythropoietin stimulating agent, mm -hmm. and the GCSF may be considered also only, only for febrile neutropenia. When we have patients with MDCML and a high number of blasts, which is more than 10% in the, in the marrow of, or more than five in the blood, then we might uh, integrate the treatment, the supportive therapy with the use of hypomethylating agents that are registered in Europe for this. I'm, I'm referring to the 5 as, as And then patients with proliferative subtypes, sorry, so proliferative subtypes, and uh, uh, a low number of blasts, uh, they should receive uh, cytoreductive, thera cytoreductive therapy, and uh, Hydria is uh, right now the, the drug of choice to control uh, the proliferative uh, molomonocytic cells and also to reduce organomegaly when present. Patients with uh, proliferative subtypes and high number of blasts, they should probably be treated with, uh, with uh, chemotherapy, maybe sometimes intensive chemotherapy or polychemotherapy, or hypomethylating agents such as the cytabine, but possibly within clinical trial. And also, uh, as I said, uh, we need to, to select patients that uh, deserve uh, uh, allogeneic transplant if they are younger than 75, maybe 70 years old, and uh, they have no major comorbidities, they might benefit from, uh, from allogeneic transplant. And with this, I want to acknowledge all the people who co co collaborated with, uh, with me and uh, gave me some help in preparing this talk. Thank you very much for your attention.